data is the fuel of deep learning. Here, our focus is on how to organize our data in the form of data sets. We will also discuss data loaders, mechanisms that provide APIs to efficiently access our data sets for training and evaluation. This is our outline. We will discuss data collection, labeling, and data structure. We will also talk about data loaders that provide efficient access to the data set. Data set is an organized data structure that stores samples and their corresponding labels. In the following, we will focus on collection and labeling. Mathematically, we represent data set D as a tuple of input X and output Y, both of which have certain dimensions. Data can be collected from various sources. It could be audio or speech, images are common, YouTube has videos, our phones and wearables generate a huge amount of data from built-in sensors. The internet is brimming with data. A good example is Wikipedia. Government and businesses generate a lot of data that are commonly stored in databases and data warehouses. In supervised learning, every sample must be labeled. In that case, a data labeling and annotation tool is needed. For vision and audio, the free software called VIA is highly recommended. Annotation is very labor intensive and time consuming. There are companies that are built on providing data labeling services. For example, companies can do bounding boxes, cuboids, points and landmarks, lines and splines, text annotations, polygons, semantic segmentation, and video annotations. As a workaround to the expensive data collection and labeling, synthetic data is usually a good alternative. In this example, we wanted to build a data set of person's gaze on an object. To supplement our manual data collection and labeling, we built an unreal environment with synthetic avatars. We also created a digital replica of our store. With this method, we were able to generate about 200,000 additional data samples. The good news is that there are plenty of publicly available data sets. Papers with Code has cataloged over 5,600 data sets. Hugging Face has a good collection of data sets in NLP. For self-driving cars, we have Apollo-scape and Waymo. Note that data collection and labeling are just the primary goals in building data sets. However, there are also other issues that a data set creator must take into consideration, such as sufficiency, data splits, and bias. How much data do we need to collect and label? The answer is as much as needed to achieve the target test performance. Most of the time, the more data, the better. However, in the end, it is about the quality of data and labels. Given sufficient sample data with labels, the next question is how do we split it? There is no hard rule. It could be one of this. The train split is where we train the model. The validation split is not used in training, but it's used to adjust the hyperparameters of the model and training configurations to an optimum level to maximize test performance. The reported model performance is measured from the test split. It is very important that no single sample is common in two or more splits. For example, if a sample is common in both train and test splits, the copy in the test split should be removed. This process is called the duplication. Data set bias is the most sensitive issue in AI. For example, there has been reports of AI-assisted recruitment tools having bias against women and people of color. In our good data set, our real-world samples are biased towards Asian-looking people. Bias can come from sampling, exclusion, racial, measurement, recall, association, and observer. PyTorch dataset is simple. 
it must be a class that supports get item and then methods. Get item accepts an integer index to the samples with labels to be retrieved. Len returns the number of samples in the data set. Samples and labels are assumed to be organized in a list or array-like data structure. There are various ways to store samples. The most common is the file system. Another form is database that is accessed through SQL APIs. It could be on the cloud that is accessed through REST APIs. It could be distributed across a large number of devices as in the case of federated learning. Fortunately for most common data sets, there are already pre-built data sets like in Torch Edition. A good example is a CIFAR 10 data set that we used. Here is another example. It is COCO data set that is used for detection, segmentation, captioning, key point detection, and other vision tests. Torch Audio has a respectable number of common audio data sets for automatic speech recognition, text-to-speech, keyword spotting, or KWS, voice cloning, and music genre recognition. Here's an example on how KWS is used. In, in this project, we built a tiny model that can recognize words from KWS data set. The model is 43 kilobytes only. The model runs on a tiny and inexpensive ARM Cortex Zero microcontroller. This is KWS in action. Stop. Up. Down. Down. Left. Right. On. Off. Yes. No. Torch Tags has a good collection of data set for NLP tests, such as classification, language modeling, machine translation, sequence tagging, and question answering. Once we already have a data set, we can now wrap it in a data loader. Why do we need to wrap it? Because data is served by batch. Furthermore, there are common routines that are useful for training, such as shuffling that dataset is not supporting. In multi-core systems, simultaneous access of dataset must be supported to avoid inconsistency and deadlock. This is how we visualize data loader as a wrapper of dataset. Of course, it is possible to directly access the dataset. It is just not practical to do, especially for high throughput systems. We instantiate a data loader class to build a data loader. Here are the most important parameters. The non-optional is data set. Second is the batch size. It is usually greater than one in the power of two for optimal GPU core utilization. Common batch size is 128. Batch size is limited by the memory of the device for training. Shuffle means that the data set is shuffled before something a mini batch. This is used during training to reduce variance and to improve the gradient estimate, since the mini batch will be closer to the dataset distribution. During validation and testing, there is no need to shuffle the sampling. Num workers greater than one means that multiprocessing is supported during data loading. This improves concurrency and throughput. Roughly, there should be about four workers per GPU. Sometimes we need to do additional pre-processing on the data. Common example is aligning data so that they all have the same sizes. Aligning can be done by padding. This operation is done in a function argument of collate fn. Lastly, pin memory increases throughput of data as it moves from memory to GPU since blocks of data that are called together are stored in the same page lock memory. See the documentation for full details. Thank you for listening. We will have a short code demo.
In this demo, we illustrate how to build a custom data set and data loader using PyTorch. We will use our collected and labeled images for object detection. There are about more than 1,645 RGB images. They were collected using an off-the-shelf USB camera. And the images were labeled using VIA. Uh, and the labels are stored in a CSV file. We will discuss about the labels and the data set later. So before continuing, please download the data set files from here. Extract the data set in the same directory as this file. The directory st structure is something like this. This is our file, and this is the data set. Before continuing this demo, please make sure that you have one B AI account. This is the sample image annotation. Here we can see that there are actually three categories: the water, soda, and juice. By default, the background is the first category. The bounding boxes and class names are also shown. Each bounding box is defined by four numbers. And the numbers define the two corners the, of the bounding box, the X mean, Y mean, and the X max, Y max, all in pixel coordinates. Let's import the required modules. Label utils is a helper module for loading the CSV file and converting a label to class name. Basically, for example, zero is converted to background, one is water, two is soda, and three is juice. It also contains a helper function to build a label dictionary from the CSV file. We then log in to 1B. Again, we need an account on 1B AI to proceed. This is the main part of our demo. We will build PyTorch dataset and data loader for custom object detection. The CSV file of the dataset can be found inside Dreams directory. It's a list of image file names and their labels. The image file names and their labels are stored in the CSV file using the following format. This is the file name and then X mean, X max, Y mean, Y max, and the class ID of the object. A label represents the coordinates of the object bounding box. We build a dictionary using path to image as the key and the corresponding label as the value. The label is a tensor of the form x min, x mass, y min, y max, and class ID. There can be multiple labels for an image since there can be multiple objects in an image. And the image class is a custom data set class that loads the images and labels using the dictionary. The image data set class is a subclass of the abstract class storage utils data data set that supports the len and get item methods as discussed in the slides. This is also known as map style method. A data set can also be iterable style that supports the iter method. Our train and test data loaders use the 1B configuration. Well, we also create a custom collate fn function to handle labels per image. Collate fn function adds all labels in a mini batch to the same size. This is the test dictionary, and these are the test classes. The train dictionary, the train classes. Basically, the train class and test class are just identical. This is the custom image data set, which inherits from Torch Utils data data set. It is initialized using dictionary and transform. It supports the len method, which is basically the length of the dictionary. It supports the get item method and accepts one parameter, which is index. The first thing it does is it retrieves the image file name using that index, and then it retrieves all bounding boxes using that key, and we open the corresponding file for that key. And if transform is not known, then we apply the necessary image transforms, and we return 
a list of images and corresponding labels. This is the train split, which is instantiated using uh, train deck. And this is test split instantiated using test deck. We use just simple two tensor transform. Then we print the length of the train split and the test split approximately, you will see this uh, 95 pi split. And we do not use uh, validation split. This is the collate FN, which is what it does basically is it converts the images into a stack of tensors. And at the same time, if the length of the labels are not uniform, it will basically compute the maximum length of labels. And if a label is shorter than max length, it will pad it with zeros. And this is a train loader instantiated using train split. And we use the batch size as shown, the shuffle, yes, for train split, the number of workers, the pin memory, and the collate FN, which is defined here. We do the same for the test loader, except that we use a test split and we do not shuffle it. Then here you can see that the train split is about 996 images and test split is about 51. Let's now visualize sample data from the train split. We visualize sample images from the train split by creating a 1B table with one column to see the images and the objects using bounding boxes and class names. The annotation is stored in a list of dictionary name as such and one dictionary per image using position, class ID, domain, and box caption as keys. The dictionary is created here by after loading the image and boxes. Please check the 1B media documentation for more details. So this is the code. We sample one mini batch and that mini batch is made of images and boxes. And we create a map of label to class name here. And then we create one table, one column. And we visit all the images and boxes. And every time we visit one image, there is corresponding label, which is made of one or more objects as defined by their bounded boxes and class IDs. So here we create the dictionary of the labels then we will use this dictionary to visualize the image and the corresponding bo bounding boxes. We also use the class labels as a reference here. So this is an example of visualization once you run this one. Here you can see the image and the bounding boxes and the corresponding class names on top of each bounding box. You can enable and disable. So it's purely interactive. That's it. Thank you.